webinar. So this is the second um, LTC COVID webinar and uh, thank you very much for joining. The first one, in case you missed the email or the blog post, uh, we put uh, the video recording and also the slides on the website so you, you can watch it as much as you like. And uh, we will do the same for this webinar. It will probably take few days, hopefully not too many, but hopefully you will have them you will have them soon. While we wait for uh, the next speaker to, to join, I'm going to show you the next um, the program for the next webinar. We've actually changed it a little bit from what we had advertised on the website because we realized that we had the opportunity to have a series of presentation on some Asian countries. So on the 1st of June, we will actually be focusing on the long-term care situation in Hong Kong, South Korea. And we hope to also have speakers from Singapore and Malaysia and waiting for confirmation. And it will be quite interesting because we've observed quite important differences between the experience of the Asian countries that we have some data for and the European and Northern American countries in particular. And we hope um, on the 8th of June, we will then focus on COVID, people living with dementia and their carers. And we've already got two conference speakers and we hope to have one or two more. If you'd like to present as ever, please let me know. On the 15th of June, we'll go back to looking at international experiences of COVID-19 and care homes. One of the speakers will be Jenny Burton and we also anticipate having some speakers from South Africa and some other countries. We will be advertising the, the program as soon as we have these two or three more speakers uh, confirmed. And I will let you know as soon as we know, through, as usually through the website, but we also try to send an email uh, to people who've been regularly contributing and engaging with LTC COVID. So I'll just check, um, Clara, are you on? Are you connected? Clara yes. Lorenz? Yeah, oh, great. Fantastic. So I'm going to, it's a great pleasure to introduce Clara Lorenz, my colleague at uh, CFET at the London School of Economics, who will be talking about um, COVID-19 and unpaid care. All yours, Clara. Thank you. I just need to um, manage to share my screen. Um, right. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me present today. And um, uh, we were talking about this, uh, well, what is very much work in progress, the impact of COVID-19 after the COVID-19 pandemic and measures on unpaid carers. Um, uh, a, a report that uh, I worked on over the last few weeks and, and that will continue be, uh, to be developed uh, as, as new evidence emerges. But um, yeah, first of all, Oops, sorry, just struggling with the screen a bit. Um, well, first of all, why, is, uh, why are unpaid carers? Well, unpaid carers are a crucial source of support for people without care needs around the world. Um, there are many people with long-term care needs that receive care and support from unpaid family members. And uh, in countries where there are existing long-term care support structures, unpaid carers continue to play a really important role. And uh, here are just some figures as examples of the number of unpaid carers that are estimated, for example, in Germany, England, and the United States. Uh, in countries uh, where there are sort of emerging long-term care systems, where those systems perhaps are not as much in place, uh, almost all care is provided by unpaid carers and therefore this is really important in, in the context of COVID-19 but also more generally. Um, unpaid carers is always a, there's an important uh, economic argument while it's difficult to quantify there are some estimates of the, the sort of money that unpaid carers safe uh, care systems if they were provided by um, other carers instead. Here are examples. For example, in England, there's an estimate of 132 billion pounds. And then in the uh, United States, the estimate is around $470 billion. Again, this is just to kind of illustrate why, um, well, one of the many reasons why it's important to look at unpaid carers. Um, right now, I just, okay. So who are unpaid carers? Well, uh, across countries, really, the majority of care, unpaid care, is provided by women. Um, uh, but it's quite interesting as uh, people grow older, there are more older uh, men who actually, as well, as 
as men grow older, they take on more care and mostly for their partners. Um, and also what's quite interesting is that older carers uh, tend to provide quite long hours of care. Um, there are interesting aspects of socioeconomic status. So uh, unpaid carers often um, have a low economic, uh, socioeconomic status. Um, many uh, are working part-time or leave employment due to their care responsibility and if they've been caring for a while experience difficulty in re-entering the labor force which then can have implications on people's income, pensions and, and savings so can have longer term implications. Um, and there are also associations with uh, poor uh, mental and physical health and lower quality of life even though many carers also gain positive aspects out of caring, doing the right thing, uh, wanting to be there uh, for the person that they support. So just that as a sort of bit of background, um, in terms of what's the impact of COVID-19 on unpaid carers, um, it's a bit difficult because there's not much out there yet, but uh, Carers UK has done a survey with uh, just over 5,000 carers and uh, former carers um, that I found and, and present here. And then also there are some aspects that came up in the news and then uh, some initial findings uh, from research that was done at the University of Liverpool. So there are kind of three core aspects. So the intensity of care and the, the percentages are from the Carers UK um, report. So 70% of carers say they provide more uh, care and um, on average they say it's about 10 hours more, which is quite substantial. Um, 35% provide more care because the services are have closed or reduced. Um, and then from the news, there are again, similar reports that there's been reduced care, um, that maybe domiciliary care workers aren't available or in some countries where migrant workers are quite prevalent, um, where these people can't travel um, and can't be available. Um, and then respite options often aren't available. Uh, another issue of financial implications in the carers um, survey, the 81% said they incurred higher costs due to food and household bills um, and 38% of those carers that took part in the survey said that they were worried about their financial situation. Then another important implication is personal well-being. Over half of carers in the survey said they felt overwhelmed and worried about burnout. Um, almost 90% they are really concerned about what would happen if they would not be able to care, if they would get ill themselves or if something else would happen, someone else would have to take over. Um, then this is from the University of Liverpool, the findings that there are feelings of loss of control, the routine, the community that normally is available. Worry about the person that carer supports, uh, if other people don't adhere to social distancing and hygiene rules, feeling overwhelmed by the kind of constant negative news. Um, and people finding it difficult to look after their own health and well-being or feeling lonely and cut off. Um, some carers also experiencing bereavement in this time where it's difficult to connect with other people. Um, but at the same time, the, study, the, the findings from the University of Liverpool and the carer survey also set, found that actually carers started to pick up and find methods to deal with that situation. So finding moments for themselves that were doing things that they enjoy, finding new routines, connecting virtually and over a fifth, well, almost 60% of carers saying that they're able to remain in contact with friends and family. So people themselves able to put these systems in place. Um, uh, colleagues of uh, mine at LSE have written a really useful paper in 2018 where they looked at what kind of interventions, what is usually there to support unpaid carers and they divided it into two parts. So interventions for people with care needs um, that can also support unpaid carers um, and interventions that are directly targeting um, unpaid carers. And um, it's quite interesting from these that based from, from what we've been seeing online um, um, and the reports that we read is that the sort of formal paid care um, and other unpaid carers, this is probably the issue where most people had difficulties having access to, um, and those are the services that probably were most reduced. But it may also be that assistive technology that enabled uh, the independence of people with care needs may be limited. So I'm thinking here of uh, sort of, for example, GPS devices that enable people with dementia to go out safely on their own. But there's this whole aspect of physical distancing, which might make this no longer a viable option. Um, 
Then there are also uh, interventions uh, targeted at unpaid carers directly. You're thinking of training, psychological support and support groups. Um, but we've seen some evidence that some of that um, was able to be moved on to online um, delivery. So that there might be some way of, of compensating for those services that cannot be taking place in person. Um, and here is um, what I found looking at the reports that uh, have been published on LTC COVID so far in terms of what are the types of uh, support measures that have been put in place or that, that have been found to be in place. And there's a lot around guidance and information, quite a lot of uh, sort of services moving, uh, moving virtually, uh, support programs, interventions. Um, some thinking about emergency support structures, some financial support, sort of making healthcare providers alert or giving them responsibilities, um, and then supporting carers in navigating some restrictions and uh, looking at COVID testing for unpaid carers. Here, I'd like to point out that the, the evidence that we, we're collecting here is, is something that, well, has been published, but whether it has been in full implemented or implemented at all, that's something that, that remains to be seen. And I think that's something that we will find over the next months um, to, to see how, what actually the impact was. So at the moment, we're just collecting um, of what's out there in terms of measures. So um, yeah, there's guidance and resources. So technical and educational guidance, guidance for specific groups. So people with dementia, people with learning disabilities who may have specific needs and how their carers can support them. Um, virtual support options been found across different countries where it facilitates social contact, um, virtual interventions, psychological support options. Some countries have moved or some organizations, and quite often these organizations actually are voluntary groups that have provided uh, virtual training, helplines that have expanded um, or have been set up um, or the hours have been expanded to just try to be there more flexibly. Um, and then some emergency support structures where they were looking at, uh, well, what would happen? This, this concern, this was, it was raised in the carer's report earlier. What would happen if the carer became unavailable to care? What could be planned? Uh, who would be there? Um, so there was at least an encouragement of thinking towards that. Um, then there are some aspects of financial support. Um, so that whether there's reimbursement for time taking off or in, in England through the furlough scheme, um, financial support to reimburse the main unpaid carer or other unpaid carers, for example, for taking over shopping or taking over sort of tasks that, that would be helpful to uh, the care situation. Um, reduced working hours um, and financial support for people with low income. So none of these things really are new, but um, for example, Germany has expanded a bit in, in terms of for how long some of these, these measures are available uh, for carer in the, carers in the context of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, then healthcare providers, some services in the American example that we found um, have used telehealth or have allowed to reimburse for telehealth, monitoring responsibilities for GPs, for example. Um, then support with navigation restrictions. So for example, in England, the idea that you can be identified as an unpaid carer, if you go shopping, you have to buy more, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when there were some items that perhaps were reduced and that might still be the case in, in, in some other countries where we don't have evidence yet. Um, where this is an issue. And then, of course, testing and the concern of whether people may be asympt um, uh, asymptomatic and but actually can't get access to testing. So um, that was something that was picked up in the England guidelines as well. Um, and then here, just very briefly, in terms of what we found from the literature that is available so far um, and from reflecting on what's been done, what's falling short and what's missing for carers. So that might be accessibly and uh, accessible and clearly community, communicated information. Um, the exemption that, as I mentioned earlier, unpaid carers can purchase more than a limited number of specific items, access to PPE so that uh, people actually can protect themselves and uh, also protect the person that they support. Um, the priority of testing, um, sort of more of support with contingency planning. So not just thinking about what's available, but actually getting some support with what's out there, what could be offered to them. Uh, an increase in financial support, uh, 
thought earlier there's quite a concern about uh, family carers and uh, especially in, in, in from Carers UK report. Um, recognition of the main unpaid carer on medical notes. So if the person with care needs becomes ill, that the carer actually um, can be part of that conversation. Uh, increased funding for remote support interventions that seem to have become very important at the moment to actually connect people to each other. Um, and then specific support for, for people that, where, where the people with care needs themselves, but also the unpaid carer may need specific support. So here I'm just thinking of people with dementia, people with learning disabilities, people with autism, and there may be other groups that uh, I haven't listed here. Um, and then I guess another important point is, is thinking about respite options. Um, and because so many carers provide so many hours and at the moment it's very difficult to get find alternative solutions to that, but actually to know that when it will be safe to do so, that there perhaps are respite options available that people can tap in. Um, so that's very brief um, what we've been finding so far and we'll continue to look what's out there in the literature and uh, sort of update the report as it's coming through. And, um, you know, if, if you have in important uh, or interesting information, um, you know, please send it our way. Uh, it would be really interesting to be able to expand on this. And this is, as I said, it's just the very first iteration of this report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to move on to the next speaker, which in this case is myself, but we will have more time for discussion. So hold your thoughts on the unpaid care. And this is also only the second of a series of webinars. So we're very, very keen to pick up on themes and issues that are being raised. So I'm now going to be sharing my screen and I'm going to be talking completely different topic um, for now, but uh, perhaps not uh, Quite related. So um, I think I'm showing you the wrong slides. <laughs> and that's the one that, yeah. So I'll be talking, I'll be uh, giving an overview of a report that's got a lot of attention <laughs> and that uh, it's one of those things that as a researcher, at least for me particularly, has made me very nervous because it's, it's a report on overview of uh, international estimates of number of deaths in care home on, of care home residents during the COVID pandemic. This is something that we started doing in LTC COVID as a, to be truthful, this was just meant to be the introduction to a paper on the different measures that countries were adopting. And what we wanted to do was to show the importance of, of uh, the pandemic and the, imp the huge impact it was having in care homes. We were looking for evidence. And then what was meant to be just an introduction to set up the scene became a, a paper in itself that was very widely publicized, even though we had very poor data. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about the experience of collecting these data and what we're learning about how to use it, what it means, and then how we can improve a bit around, on, on our understanding of these impacts. First of all, I'm, I want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, Jose Barralacain, Charles Litwin, Amy Tzu, Natasha Lane, and Jose Luis Fernandez. But I'd also like to thank, and uh, there's a lot of people to thank, of all these people who've been sending us in quite often entire fragments of text to help us understand the, the right sources of data to use in different countries and how to interpret them. And of course, any errors, any and any uh, omissions and views expressed here are my sole responsibility. So why do we need to know about the deaths of uh, care home residents linked to COVID? Well, when this whole crisis started in many countries, deaths in care homes were not included in the initial, um, and, and what we found is that care homes were not at all included in the initial policy responses and measures taken with regards to COVID, we found that the focus was very much on stopping transmission in the community and also in boosting hospital capacity and ensuring that hospitals had the resources they needed. But we, I, we, it has become apparent that in some other countries, the situation was different. And in Asia in particular, where they had SARS and MERS experience, there was actually a strong infection prevention control systems in care homes that were being activated as the pandemic started. For quite a long time, we had no data on the number of people infected and deceased in care homes. And of course, when you don't have that data, that means that it's quite, 
there's a big risk that vital resources that we need to tackle infections in care homes are not being made available. It's a case of what we don't see, you, don't, you assume doesn't happen. So because we couldn't see all these deaths in care homes or there were only sporadic newspaper reports at the beginning, you could easily just focus on hospitals from a policy perspective or, or on models that only took into account people living in the community. But uh, things changed. So around March, uh, of course, we were starting to have newspaper reports on the situation from Italy, Spain, Belgium, and France, particularly, on large numbers of deaths in care homes and also of situations in which care homes were becoming overwhelmed by, by that. What it means is that lots of people were becoming ill at once, but also lots of staff were having to stay home because either they had symptoms or they might have, they needed to self-isolate and the LDC COVID website started on the 20th of March and it was trying to document these early international reports and share information to try and generate early alerts about uh, what was probably happening to, many, uh, to, to an increasing number of countries. For quite a while, official data on deaths in most countries only included confirmed deaths through, through of people who had been tested and not in care homes. By the end of March and early April, uh, France, Belgium and Ireland started to publish data on deaths in care homes and we were able to obtain some an official estimate from Italy and Spain and with my um, with Joseva Talagain and myself we've actually at the same time we've both found out remotely that we were both trying to collect the same data so um, we basically uh, decided to join efforts and then we produced this very first report that was picked up by the media. We published it on the 12th of April and uh, basically from these five countries where we had reasonable data for three of them, less than ideal for Italy and Spain, but we could see that the share of deaths that were linked to COVID according to the sources that we had at the time were ranging between 40 and 57 percent. So that was about half of all deaths linked to COVID were happening in care homes and that was a really big share. So until then all we had seen were newspaper reports and it was very difficult to put those in perspective and to understand what the full impact was. And what did those estimates tell us? Well, the, the quality of the data, um, particularly for Spain and Italy, as I said, were, were not ideal at all. But what this was telling us was that it was, there was an urgent need to ensure that care homes were equipped with the resources they needed to deal with the pandemic. And these resources range from testing to having enough staff, to having access to personal protection equipment. Sometimes they might need additional space to be able to quarantine people. They also needed up-to-date guidance and training to respond to the situation. We also uh, found, um, were aware that the national estimates of COVID deaths at, to that point and in most countries were basically an underestimate because they were not including large numbers of people who were dying in care homes or who are called care home residents. These ha we have now been working more on the report. Uh, more countries have been publishing data. We've also become uh, aware of other countries. And uh, the latest version of the report, we published it on the 21st of May. And as you can see here, of course, when you have a country like the US with so many people, it kind of dwarfs the others in this graph. But um, what's interesting to see in this graph, what you can see the bars are the total number of deaths in the population. And the dots are the shares um, of all deaths that are care home residents. And if you, the, this is on the right hand column in terms of seeing the, which percentage that is. And what we see is that in countries with the lower numbers of total deaths, we see fewer, a, a lower share of those happening in care homes. But once the number becomes um, higher in the community, we also see a higher share of deaths in care homes. And there seems to be, this seems to stabilize a little bit, so we've done the trend here, but there's the, 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 this sort of share at around 40 to 50% seems to be a, a reasonable share for countries that have, uh, or estimate for countries that have had large number of deaths. And as we added these more countries, as you could see from the previous slide, that the policy message was, was beginning to change. It wasn't just to say we've been missing out on all these people who are dying in care homes, as we could say before, but now we can also say that what we see particularly from countries where they have 
uh, low numbers of deaths in the community is that high numbers of deaths in care homes may not be inevitable. There are differences between the countries. So it's very important that we focus on policies and measures and about learning about what works. And uh, we can also uh, see that there seems to be also a, a sort of plateau in terms of how the the rates of deaths increase. The countries for which we have the, the longest trends of data, and I think by now we could also be doing this for England and, and Scotland, but we haven't had time yet to add this to the slide. But what we can see is that both in France and Belgium, the share of deaths increased a bit, but then it became quite stable at around this 40, 50%. Uh, in the case of Belgium, in here where only uh, this includes people who die in care homes, the figures for France are a bit different because you're able to distinguish between deaths that happened in hospitals, deaths that happened in care homes, and the upper um, line, the dark blue line for France is the deaths of all care home residents. And this also brings me very nicely to the next question, which is what are we comparing with what? <laughs> because there are many, many differences in the way that these data are gathered in different countries. There are differences in how care homes are defined, there are differences in the types of deaths that I covered, and by types of deaths, I mean uh, deaths that have been confirmed through a test of COVID. So we know that through that the person who died had, uh, had tested positive for COVID. Then there are deaths that either the care home or a doctor uh, noted that uh, they thought that the death was linked to, co to COVID. This would be what we call probable or suspected deaths. And this, of course, would be a larger number of deaths than, than the, uh, if you add them together with the ones that have been tested positive. And then the, the biggest number of deaths would be the one that you'd get at by calculating excess deaths. And by excess deaths, what we do to calculate this, we compare the number of people who've died in the same time of the year now with those who died on average in previous years. And that, um, that has the advantage as it tells us not only the cases where there were clear symptoms of COVID, for example, enough that somebody would detect them or where people had been tested, but it also tells us potentially about deaths that may be due to the, to the measures taken uh, with regards to the pandemic. So for example, or, or through behaviors as a result of the pandemic happening. And this may include, for example, not going to the doctor or not going to hospital when you'd have a, a condition for which you'd normally be seeking help. And it's very important that we are aware that it, it's very likely that the true death burden of COVID-19 will always be found through looking at excess deaths and not at the deaths that have been either confirmed through testing or suspected. And then the other big difference that we found is that some of the, the deaths um, data were covering people who died in care homes whereas in other countries we had data for all care home residents irrespective of whether they died in the care home, in a hospice or in hospital. And of course, it's hard to compare one to the other because the rates of hospitalization among care home residents will have been different depending on, for example, how much pressure there was on the health, on the hospitals. So with all these number of complications, what we are now trying to do in this uh, report is to try to be very precise about where the data that we have for each of the country comes from. And so we have this slightly complicated table by now where, we're try where we explain what is the approach to measuring deaths, then what are the total number of deaths, and, and we try to clarify whether the deaths are are um, deaths of uh, care home residents or deaths in care homes. And again, make sure that we try to compare it against the, the right population. So um, the latest fund findings that we have from the 21st of May report is that there still have been no infections of deaths in care homes in Hong Kong. So that has the, the lowest, uh, the Z that has had zero deaths and infections in care homes. But of course, in the entire Hong Kong, there were only for deaths in, in COVID and of course of COVID. And of course that is a very clear illustration of what happened of that. If you control COVID in the community, you have controlled it in care homes too. Uh, we've seen a range of, of data in other countries and uh, for the countries where we had at least 100 deaths in total and we have official data, 
the percentage of COVID-related deaths among care home residents is ranging from 24% in Hungary to a very high 82% in Canada. And as we stressed before, the definitions used make a huge difference. And we also now are very lucky in England to be able to, to, to look at this data in the four possible different ways. So in England, we're able to compare the share of all probably, probable COVID deaths in care homes, and that brings it to 27%. Um, it's the data we had available at the end of last week. We can also look at the share of all probable deaths of care home residents, and that takes it to 38%. That includes the people who died, for example, in hospital. And then if we took, if you, we take the other definition, which is we compare the number of deaths that have been this year during the months of the pandemic with previous years, the share of excess deaths compared to the excess death in the total population is 44%. And if we then look at deaths of care home residents, then that includes the people who will have died in hospital, the share is 52% of all excess deaths. And I think that gives a very clear illustration of the importance of using the right metrics. And they could take very, you could come up with very different conclusions about how uh, residents in care homes have fared in England if you only looked at one of these numbers and not at the others. In France, we're also able to compare the deaths in care homes with deaths of all care home residents and the difference is between 30%, 34% and 51%. And South Korea is an interesting example because of their policies. They had no deaths in care homes, but they did have 84 deaths of care home residents at the end of April. So I hope that this helps at least uh, give a better understanding of how to interpret this data when you see it and how to take it with a pinch of salt. We've also been then thinking about other ways in which to try to show the impact of COVID. Uh, so uh, going, instead of looking at the share of all deaths here, what we've done is for the countries where we were reasonably confident, although it's not quite the case for Germany, but that the, that we, that the definition of care homes would at least include all the people who would have been included in the deaths data. We were able to look at the share of all care home residents who have died um, either due to the pandemic or during the pandemic compared to other years. And uh, here again, you can see the, uh, that, that although, for example, Canada had the highest share of deaths that were of care home residents, if you actually compare to the total number of care home residents, it's only been 0.9% of uh, residents who have died compared to, for example, Belgium, where the share is 3.7%. And uh, we hope to be able to, in the future, present this data also for more countries. And again, we have the example of the United Kingdom. Here we didn't include data from Northern Ireland. We also didn't include the numbers of people who uh, died in hospital in Scotland. But uh, so these uh, shares may be an underestimate, but if you use the death sensitivity to COVID definition, the share of care home residents who've died is 3.4%, whereas if you look at excess deaths, you're looking at 6.7%. And of course, you have to be, make sure when you compare countries that you, you use the same metrics where possible, otherwise you may up, end up with very unfair comparisons. So to conclude, uh, while it's very important to measure and report the number of uh, deaths of care home residents, international comparisons are very tricky. Uh, the share of total deaths in, in care homes is important to know because it does tell us to what extent, for example, um, official figures may be underestimating total deaths if they only include confirmed cases. And it also may help uh, ensure that uh, there's better um, allocation of, of potentially scarce resources, for example, testing, PPE, nurses quarantine, if you're able to show that a very substantial share of deaths are deaths in care homes, then there's a very good argument you can make towards more resources being used um, in that sector and not only, for example, uh, being used in hospitals. And uh, we, the other thing we can see is that, of course, the, the shares of total care home residents offer quite a different perspective and even a different ranking. For example, if we want to rank countries on the impact of COVID-19 on care home residents. We're also very aware that we need to understand other impacts. We need to understand 
the deaths of care home staff. Uh, we know that, the, that many care home staff have been infected and there have been many uh, reports of, of deaths of care home staff. And we, in England, for example, we can calculate excess deaths of people who rely on care in the community. Australia is also reporting uh, deaths of people who use care in the community, but we haven't found that for other countries yet. And we will also need to understand, and we're hoping to find out uh, more about the other impacts, the, the other physical and mental health impacts of both the pandemic and the measures taken um, to try to mitigate it. And the next steps for us, uh, subject hopefully to some funding and, and, uh, and all of us being able to continue with this, uh, we, are now, we have now developed a protocol for a systematic review of the impact of COVID-19 in care homes and of the effectiveness of different measures. We want to continue to learn from evidence and experience of other countries, try to inform policy, and we hope that uh, as the data improves, we're also able to look a bit more deeply on differences, for example, in the characteristics of the population in care homes in different countries. They may have different age and gender, uh, may, um, Makers that may have different degrees of dependency in health status, there may be higher prevalence of dementia in, some, in care homes in some countries than in others, for example, or of, of people with underlying other underlying health conditions. There may be very important differences in the types of care homes that are included in the state, on the size, on the number of rooms with shared beds, for example, uh, with shared rooms, sorry. And uh, there may also be uh, um, other structural issues like um, the pay and conditions and staff that affect that may have an effect on on infection rates, and of course we want to continue to improve methods towards comparing like with like. So I'm going to stop here. I also don't want to take any more time from my the next speaker, Eric, because uh, we've got 20 minutes left and for the hour, which is the time we have for presentations. And I don't want to eat into his time because what he's going to say, hopefully after what you've heard here, we'll, you'll see quite how important it is to get right. And we do have another half hour for those of you who can say, so if you have any questions for me, please save them until later or email me. And I'm very happy to uh, pass the floor to Eric. Hi. Hi there. Um... Um, let me see. Can you see things? You can see? Yeah? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. You can hear me as well? Yes. All right. So in case you, um, I don't know, if, if, if it becomes, uh, if it doesn't sound very good, just let me know, will you? Um, yeah, okay. So right. this, yeah, I'm just going to spend 15 minutes just going over um, uh, the infection prevention and controlling care homes um, taking into account the issue of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic um, transmission. Um, so yeah, um, a, a few things we're going to do is just to have a quick overview of the Public Health England and Public Health Scotland guidance at the moment, um, see where we're up to date on that, look at the um, transmission of COVID-19 in care homes, how does that happen? Um, and then look at it, maybe at the end, we'll look at the effective measures that we sort of think are needed for this particular virus. So, um, current guidance of Public Health England, uh, this was from 18th of May. Uh, it was an updated document from 18th of May. Uh, basically, you can see on the top, section 3.1, um, we basically still look at um, the idea that um, the, the, the transmission of COVID-19 is very similar, like the SARS outbreak in 2003. Um, and section 3.2, um, similar thing, you know, that we're not really infectious until we get symptoms. Um, that was the case in 2003. Um, so this is what uh, Public Health England have been basing things on even up till now, apparently. Um, uh, this is, this, these are three shots from um, the admission and care of residents. Uh, document again, Public Health England guidance. The first one is showing um, the infectious case. So basically, this is someone who has symptoms, basically, um, and then uh, if people have symptoms, then you put on your PPE, and you, if they don't have symptoms, then you just provide care as normal, quote quote, which we think means without PPE, presumably. Um, and what's the last thing I've got here? Uh, yes, yeah, so then and the summary is that if you do all of this, then patients can be cared for um, uh, safely. Uh, so that's what Public Health England is saying. Um, 
So let's move on then. Um, so yeah, uh, let's look at what happens uh, with transmission if we base the infection prevention control um, on symptoms only. So let's just do that. Let's assume that this guidance is okay. So we can say we've got three types of people, uh, the ones that don't have symptoms, so the green ones, um, the ones that may have just come into the care home from somewhere else, so then we're going to isolate them for 14 days. They can be orange, amber, and then we've got the people that have symptoms who are red. Um, so if we just take those three, and in a care home we might have, they're all mixed together. So current guidance is basically that you try to sort of group them together, you put the red together, you put the asymptomatic together, and then uh, and the, you quarantine the, um, the, the amber ones and you sort of shield or sort of um, isolate the, the red cases, the symptomatic ones. Um, so the green people over there on the left can be, uh, care as normal can be given to them, apparently. Um, and we have, so care as normal by uh, staff that are allocated for the asymptomatic, so that in the guidance we have staff allocated for those, and then we have staff allocated for the red uh, and quarantine zone. Um, so, also, you know, that's that's basically what's being suggested, um, or has been suggested up till recently. So, what's the problem with that? Um, yeah, this this doesn't really take into account um, people that are symptom uh, before they get symptoms. So they might two types of things. One, you can be asymptomatic and you don't get symptoms uh, later anyway, but you're still infectious and you don't know it. And then you get the pre-symptomatic ones that don't have symptoms, but they will get symptoms some days later. Um, but in both of those cases, um, uh, with with uh, cor uh, coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, this one, this virus now, it peaks five days earlier than the one from 2003, unfortunately. So actually, the, the, the guidance to say that um, you become infectious when uh, you get symptoms is actually not the case at all with this virus, and that's the problem we have with the PHC guidance, you see. Um, so why is that a problem? So we know that people that don't have symptoms can have the disease and can be infectious to others. We know that. It's very, very clear. Um, asymptomatic carriers can continue to be asymptomatic, but they might also be pre-symptomatic, like I was saying. Um, care homes we know is full of vulnerable people. So therefore, if you don't account for the asymptomatic transmission routes or risk, then you, inf you risk infecting all those vulnerable people. Um, so let's take a look at what that means in practice. So again, we have uh, in this case, uh, um, in this example, we've got one asymptomatic um, positive uh, green resident. So somebody that doesn't have symptoms, but is in fact um, COVID positive. So this one over um, on, on the left, we have one, uh, let's see what there's, there's one um, uh, asymptomatic staff member uh, that, that she's, uh, in this case, is providing care for the green residents. And we've got one um, uh, symptomatic and positive uh, red resident member. But we also have somebody who's got symptoms but actually wasn't positive as well. That's also possible. So it's a bit complicated. Um, now here we, we see that the um, people will be putting on PPE and so on, but um, PPE we, we know also gives us false sense of security. Um, so I'll come on to that a bit later, actually. Um, so let's have a look. So yes, on, on this right-hand side, we've got the quarantine people, we've got the people with symptoms that are isolated, and hopefully we've got good infection control by good hand hygiene and so on, and PPE and, and things on that direction. But what about all those asymptomatic people on the left-hand side? Well, the issue here is that we can have residents infecting other residents if we don't keep a social distance. We can have, yeah, they, there's another one, staff, especially through high touch surfaces. So um, door handles, for example, or shared equipment or all kinds of things. If you don't have obsessive hand hygiene at every single point, you risk this going on. So anything from bed railings to surfaces to tables to whatever, this virus is very transmissible. So if we don't have those barriers in place, this is what's gonna happen. Um, so what's the evidence we have for this? Well, there's quite a lot coming out now. Um, I'll just take you to, through uh, two of them. Um, so this is for the, the, one of these ones from the US that's been out there for a while now um, that they found about 30% of residents in a skilled nursing facility had COVID, um, but that more than half of them, sorry, more than half of them were 
without symptoms initially. Um, conclusion from that was you cannot base your infection control on symptom-based screening only. Conclusion. Now that conclusion has been around for quite a while now, so I don't know why in in England, we don't, haven't come to that conclusion. Um, there's another one that summarizes quite nicely the issue. Um, uh, you know, a certain number of uh, people were, were um, pre-symptomatic, and, and yet when, the, when they were swabbed, those swabs turned into live virus later on, as in they could be cultured. So we know that people are infectious when they, without symptoms. Uh, their conclusion was symptom-based approaches are inadequate. Okay. So... Um, we know that they're inadequate. Those are just two examples. I mean, there's a lot more, as you're going to see here, lots of papers in there. Um, I've only put these in because somebody watching on playback can screenshot it or pause it and, and just have a look themselves. And there's another one here. Um, but basically, yes, we know that this is the issue now. Um, what does Scotland say? Well, Scotland came up with something on the 16th of this month, May. Um, it was around testing and care home uh, testing in care homes, but um, interestingly, they've gone down. They've sort of caught up and said, "Yes, asymptomatic transmission is really a big issue. We need to resolve it." Um, so, the first box on the top is just a screenshot from the document. Basically, NERVTAG, the advisory group, the, the Emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group, um, couldn't come up with definitive recommendations by the end of April. So, basically. Um, Scotland just decided to produce their own interim guidance um, in the meantime based on um, uh, care professionals and, and so on. So um, what does this say? Um, oops, oh, that's what I was supposed to be yeah, doing. Right, so um, yeah, basically this is looking at, um, you probably can't see that, um, but here they're saying that uh, symptomatic, being symptomatic was neither sensitive nor specific for proven COVID infection in terms of residents and st or staff being positive. Um, asymptomatic people shedding the virus um, in large significant numbers uh, before they've got symptoms. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, up to, sometimes up to uh, half and sometimes more of residents and staff could be COVID positive. Um, I mean, I know it's talk, talking to care home managers and uh, around the place. Um, I know they've had their own experience where they've tested. For example, I just wrote down one here. Um, somebody had 20 people tested. That was 11 residents, nine staff. Uh, five of them, so that's one staff and four residents. So let's say 25% of that, those that were tested were a positive test, but without symptoms. Uh, and then two of those uh, got went on to get symptoms and the rest didn't. So, you know, um, so I think we, we can say that we know asymptomatic transmission is a big problem. So uh, what do we do about it? So we need to put those barriers up. And, you know, this is the social distancing within the care home. Uh, it's PPE, of course. It's constant obsessive hand hygiene after, hygiene after touching every surface. That means every time you touch the door handle, every time you touch... Um, a railing every time you touch a, a table or whatever. This sort of idea that, because um, we know the, the issue is that we know um, it's not just about person to person. So somebody coughs on you and you get it, sure, maybe it's possible. Um, but it's also, it's really because you've, you know, what I've just done now with my nose, you know, and I've touched my pen, and now I've taken my pen into a residence room and I've left it on the table. And, you know, this is how the virus spreads. So, it needs to be very, very clear. Um, and there's, there's other research coming out about, actually there was one from China where they looked at um, uh, swabbing surfaces to find out where the virus was. And actually they were finding the highest one was in, on a table, far away from the positive, uh, it was a child, a positive um, patient, and they were, it was far away. And they thought, well, this is probably down to their healthcare work of putting things down on a table. So really it's very, uh, and that's actually what they found in 2003. Um, that the transmission from surfaces to, um, was, was a big issue. Um, and if you could prevent the transmission from surfaces to people, um, as well as people to people, that, that resolved a lot of the things. Um, so that informed the zoning approach or the traffic control bundling as it's known as. Um, and so that sort of uh, informed us to come up with some kind of strategy based on the same thing. Um, this virus is more transmissible than 
the one from 2003, so we should do at least what they did in 2003, if not more, you know? We find we're doing less, so this doesn't really make sense. Um, so yes, but oh, before this, uh, so testing, um, that will help us later on, sure, but you know, it needs to be done often enough. The re results need to be rapid enough to be useful and high reliability as well. I mean, I was just reading in the Guardian this morning, 20 to 30% are false negatives from the tests. Um, and that's being swept under the carpet, um, like a lot of stuff's being swept under the carpet. So we, we, we're, even if you had lots of testing, it's got to be reliable enough as well. Um, at the moment, the results seem to be coming back in two days plus. Um, and in those two days, what's happened with your staff member who got tested? They're shedding, if they're asymptomatic and positive, they've been shedding the virus. So we can't rely on testing. We really, at the moment, we have to rely on um, those secondary barriers. So secondary barriers being meaning those things that prevent, assuming that you are carrying the virus, do you prevent that getting on surfaces and people? Um, so the strategy for doing that it's, it's quite a bit of strategy, but it sort of hinges around the idea of zoning and around hand, obsessive hand hygiene everywhere. Um, so that's brought us onto here. So um, this is where uh, our care home strategy went online uh, 18th of April, I think. That's um, oh, it's more than a month now already. Um, and it's been updated and it, is, it seems to have gone to quite high levels in the UK. So hopefully it's going to make some waves. Um, uh, in that, we talk about, um, well, we just showed two types of layouts, but the idea coming from Taiwan's experience in 2003 is that you try to zone your house from the beginning to the end, so the front door to the back door, the bottom floor to the top floor. You try to sort of group your, um, uh, your residence if you can, but you might not be able to, for example, in this case, looking from above a plan section, plan view, um, maybe your residence can't be moved. So this is the idea is just to try to, um, define your building by risks. Um, it's not to say that you don't have virus possibility in the green zone, but you have less risk of it happening there. And the cr critical thing here is that those little um, triangles are hand hygiene stations. So the idea of having zones is um, not that it's a magical thing and you don't have virus outside the zone. It's like lower risk in a green than an amber zone, and it's lower risk in amber than red. But those when you're crossing a zone, you have a sign saying you're crossing now a zone, um, it nudges you to do your hand hygiene. And this is a thing, it's a psychological nudge to get physical behavior. Um, so this, 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 this layout we came up here is not to say this is gonna happen in North Carolina, but it was more like a pragmatic, um, sort of trying to sort of, in an imperfect scenario, looking at what you would do when you don't have sufficient space and so on. So, um, so that's, yeah, we, we looked at the different zones according to categories of residents. So even in the, the green zone, is, is it includes um, the staff area, but it also includes, you can look back here, residents' rooms, which basically people without symptoms. But they, they might have COVID, but they're without symptoms. But there's lower risk. It doesn't mean that we don't use PPE with those residents. Um, no, we do all our hand hygiene on PPE. So here we can say PPE is still valid for those those parts of the green zone, um, but it's just, it's, it's lower risk. And it also, we still keep track of symptoms, you know, a much wider range of symptoms for older people um, because we want to keep track on their health, you know, and we can also use that to sort of inform our risk zone, but it does not, just because somebody doesn't have symptoms does not mean you don't use PPE or you don't have those rigorous measures in place. Um, so hand hygiene, what do we mean by that? Well, alcohol-based drug, 70% at least, or alcohol-based foam. Um, but every time you touch surface, so before you touch the door handle, and then you go in the room and you do disinfect your hands after you've touched the door handle. And, you, and then you might say, well, that's a bit obsessive. Well, yes, it is, but this is it. High touch surfaces, you disinfect before and after. Um, even if you have your gloves on. Now here you've got this, this issue with, with people thinking they put their gloves on and they're protected. As a staff member, yes, you are. But your gloves, as soon as they've touched a, if I had gloves on now and I've touched my filthy pen, um, the gloves are now dirty and now I'm going to touch something else with my filthy glove. Gloves or hands, same thing. If I haven't disinfected it, it can now spread the virus. So the issue of PPE, just having gloves, it lulls you into this false sense of security. 
Um, that's exactly what they found in 2003. So it's, this is nothing new. So we want a hand hygiene at every point, outside and inside each door, um, at places where you will um, ha share equipment points, um, at the laundry, at the PPE uh, donning, uh, putting on and doffing the taking off zone, um, and it, at as many places you can. And we have signs as well for all of these things. For example, make sure you wash your hands, you know. Um, this is one thing, let me just say it. Um, uh, I think it's long enough ago now that I can probably say this, but 2014 I was sort of helping to try to get the infection prevention and control under, under, under control in um, the, uh, an Ebola treatment center in Sierra Leone and trying to get people, including medics, including medical people, to wash their hands simply. That was a bit of a challenge. So I'm not convinced just because somebody is medical or trained and something that they will know about this. So we need those nudges from the zoning to help us to try to do that. That brings me on to the last slide. Okay, so that's the, 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 the we've got this document, the zoning strategy, um, sorry, care home infection control strategy, which is based around hand hygiene and about zoning. So you can see that's the table of contents there. Um, that's section two and three. There's lots of other stuff in there around PPE, stuff allocation, stuff rotors, entrances. Um, what about laundry? We, we got waste, um, staff health as well. Um, and, and what happens if you want to disinfect your PPE? How do you make up the chlorine solution to be at the right concentration? Um, so there's a lot of this stuff, but we don't have time. So that's the end of it. Um, again, here's the link in case people want to um, have a look. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And we have a bit of time for those of you who can stay a bit longer. And I already see some questions on the chat box. Um, shall, so I, Eric, shall I yes. screen off? Yes, please, because then I can see, we can see better also people who are uh, seeking to speak. So I'm going to start uh, from the last question backwards, I think we might do, because Eric is already unmuted, so I might as well do. There's a comment from Jane, would you like to, to make it yourself? Uh, Jane D, you are muted. Uh, I can read the comment, if not. So Jane, uh, yes, yeah. hi, sorry, my camera's Great. not working. Hi, yeah. No problem. I think, that, I think I just made comment there about zoning because I am a manager of a care home in Scotland. We don't have any COVID-19, I hate to say that, we don't have any COVID-19 cases. I always worry when I say it um, and haven't had any um, over our two care homes. Um, but um, the, the question on zoning, this has been brought up before, but the way our care homes are built, uh, they're all on one level and residents are in their own rooms, we wouldn't be able to move them. And um, we, wouldn't we don't have any spare rooms to move them to. Um, uh, so uh, that was one of the things, but, but I also am really keen to understand what has happened in other countries such as Hong Kong, because Scotland, the narrative in Scotland is, is really negative around care homes. It's not helpful to, to the people who work in care homes. So I'm really keen to sort of learn more so that we can continue to remain sort of, um, to have this, this situation that we have, which is, which is um, COVID free environments and try and sustain that for as long as possible. Thank you, Jane. I think we happen to have, um, I, I, is Terry still, uh, Terry Lum, are you still on the, I think I've seen you comment earlier. Oh yeah, yeah, I am still here. Hi, Terry. <laughs> Hi. So uh, just to introduce, this is Terry, who some of you may have seen give evidence at the Health and Social Care Select Committee last week Hello. from the University of Hong Kong. Thank you. Yeah. So do you like to comment a bit on the experience in Hong Kong um, of uh, and the type of measures adopted in care homes? I know you're going to actually you're going to speak next week, so don't don't tell us too much, otherwise people won't join next week. But just a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think what Eric said about the asymptomatic uh, patients are really real. And then, but we know very early on uh, from the SARS experience that we cannot wait until people have symptoms and then do the prevention. So in fact, what we found out, we, we just have a very interesting experiment in Hong Kong using the golden hamster 
as an experiment. So that one actually, actually will come out from a journal, infectious disease called, um, you know, very soon. So what they did was um, they have one group of um, ham site infected, the other group not, and then they put the face mask in between. So what they found out is if they even just put the face mask in between, they will cut down the infection by close to 80% alone. So, so I think the face masks are really one of the big uh, things that help Hong Kong to, to protect Hong Kong. But another thing I want to share is in Hong Kong, we do not use care home as for isolation. So um, anyone who has been suspected with the symptom, we will send them to hospital for isolation and treatment. And then uh, for anyone who has close contact with the patient infected, we will put them into quarantine center for 14 days for observations. So although we do not have an outbreak or any cases in Hong Kong so far in nursing home, but the government in fact has set aside a vacation kind of, you know, um, uh, as they, you know, um, usually for people go for a vacation during the summer as a quarantine home in case there is an outbreak in nursing home. So it has it never been used, but we, it has been set aside in Hong Kong so that in case there is any outbreak, they can isolate the residents in nursing home in that facility instead of allowing them to stay in the nursing home. So one issue is because in Hong Kong, in early nursing home, the minimum space requirement for each residence for space is only 6.5 square meters. So you know how, how close people are. So if there is one single outbreak without isolation, it can be spread all over the nursing home in days. So, so that become extremely important for us. So I will share more next week. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Terry. Yeah. I think that also a, a, an issue that seems to be emerging looking at international experiences, that many countries have made available additional spaces recognizing that mm -hmm. maybe care homes in, they, they all did, they're all different, they all have different layouts and different space availabilities and they may have a limited capacity in the UK, for example, they may be able to effectively isolate a smaller number of people than their total number of residents because of their layout. And it's important to be realistic about what each care home specifically is able to implement and achieve. I don't know, Eric, if you'd like to comment, come back on, the, on any of this? Yeah, no, just, uh, I was just going to say, well, yes, the, the whole um, idea of the strategy was to try to be pragmatic. You know, what's the, what would you do in a worst case scenario? You know, and everyone, every care home is different and some are they have much fewer staff, less resources, less space, less this, less that. So there are constraints. I think the idea would be, I mean, what I would love to, to do is to have every care home manager read this, this what we think should happen for uh, infection control in care home uh, and try to then adapt as far as they can in the concept once they've understood the principles, once they sort of understand it at a basic level, then you can adapt to context rather than just thinking, oh, we don't have testing yet, or, or we don't have enough PPE, or, you know, yes, but th those are elements of it, but it's not, you know, the main thing is you need to trans trans stop the transmission from people to people and people to objects and objects to people, and you need to do that throughout the building. If people can get that in their heads, then they can figure out what they can and probably can't do, but what they can do a lot to try to reduce the transmission. And also, I just think, you know, it, I mean, we know that a, 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 a significant percentage of care homes didn't get a case yet. Well, that's today, and, and you know, second wave might be coming, and so on. And the virus th is the same. And the more lockdown is eased, the more care home staff that go to and from work every day will probably pick up the virus as asymptomatic carriers. So um, probably it's going to become more of an issue. So now is the chance we have to put in good uh, infection control in the care homes that didn't have cases yet. Um, Thank you. Uh, we've got a comment from Selina Rajan. Would you like to, uh, to speak, to unmute yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, it was really just to reiterate, I suppose, the same issue that, that each home is different. And, um, and certainly in the UK, we find that some, particularly the newer homes, may find it easier to zone. Um, but in others, in others that are smaller and older, that's just as Jane has mentioned already, that that they don't have the space to be able to zone. I think it's really helpful for these homes to be thinking, just like you say, that each of these is just an element of a much bigger, um, of a bigger strategy. It's not just about PPE or testing. And sometimes if they can't zone people to a specific area, there are their own sort of bespoke ways that they can find. And this has been really helpful. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Eric, yeah. There as well. it's by, by, by zoning, it's like we, we had that first layout where you had the three floors with different colours, but we also had the second layout where pretty much residence rooms next to each other with different colours. So, in other words, what by the zoning concept, we're just saying that, you know, if, if people can't be grouped, that's also fine. You just you just deal with the situation, the layout you have. Um, uh, but then you, you're basically putting signs up everywhere and making everyone aware about what where the zone risks are and what you do when crossing zones. Um, it's not necessarily that you, you need another floor or two. Thank you. I've got a comment from Simon Wheeler, I think if I pronounce it correctly. Do you like to unmute? Um, not everybody. Oh, yes, uh, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. I think you're muted. Uh, is that better? Yeah, now we can hear you. Um, I, I've made a few comments, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to ask a different question, if that's okay, which is yeah. um, that uh, I work for a Alzheimer's Society in the UK, um, so my, uh, spe my, my specific concerns are in relation to the health and well-being of, of residents in care homes with dementia. Um, one of the really uh, severe problems that has come about as a result of the lockdown measures and as a result of the hygiene measures that have been put into place in care homes has been the catastrophic effect it's had on the psychological well-being and on the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia that people uh, living in care homes with dementia are experiencing as a result of being isolated or as a result of having their routines greatly changed um, and it, although I concur with, some, with, with everything that I've heard today in terms of, the, in terms of trying to prevent transmission, um, I, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that this happens in a context where care home managers are constantly having this conflict of, of trying to manage risk um, where, yes, you could if you locked everybody up and fed them you know, through the, through the, you know, underneath the door and, um, and nobody ever touched anybody, then yes, you could prevent COVID from being transmitted within a care home. But uh, in order to try and balance that with the well-being, the psychological well-being of, of residents, there needs to be some kind of social interaction, either with care home staff and residents, uh, between residents and other residents and between visitors and residents. And I've been contacted by members of the public many times over the last two months uh, with, uh, with stories of, of what they perceive to be excessive um, clamping down of interaction in the care home and their extreme concern for the, their loved one in the care home. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, how, how can we achieve that balance? Um, the risk zone thing sounds like a really good idea because then in the green zones you could have some amount of interaction um, But then what about the people who are not in the green zone? Um, uh, how do we how do we keep them? from Hurting themselves quite literally when they are in isolation because that, that happens an awful lot um, You know when 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 they're in isolation and they start hallucinating and having delusions, you can have really quite extreme reactions to that level yes. of isolation. So it's a real balance. I just thought we should address it somehow. I, I think it's hugely important. And whereas it's relatively easy, I mean, this is terrible actually, but it's relatively easy to count how many people have died. And you, could, you can just, because you, you, it's very obvious, it's much harder to have any kind of data and information on all these other impacts. And I do wonder whether some of these excess deaths, excess mortality, maybe even reflecting people who have stopped eating because they find the situation to be so terrible and they have no other ways of expressing uh, well, their, their frustration. Is, yes. Anorexia <laughs> is a presenting symptom now. In, yes. In, along with hyperactive delirium, anorexia seems to be the, the other kind of atypical symptom of COVID that a lot of, uh, a lot of people are missing. So it's yes. really difficult tell the difference. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not a medic, but no, no. I imagine it's very difficult to tell the difference. 
Yeah, I think it's an extremely complicated situation. And I mean, I mean, taking a sort of slight step back now, I think we also need to be very aware of, of what is the, the local situation around each care home. And I think very good communication between, between local public health authorities and care home managers about the level of risk in different parts of the country, in different local areas are, are also vital because it may be that you are pretty much certain or as much certain as you can be that there's very low risk of transmission in the wider community where a care home is situation, the, the level of precautions you need to take may be a bit different than when you are still having a lot of community transmission where the care home is, therefore a lot of risk of the virus coming in through, for example, members of staff or visitors. Um, it's a very difficult one. I don't think, Eric, it would be very fair for to ask you uh, no, no, about no. this. I don't know if you want to come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'd be interested, Simon, if you could um, have a look at section seven of that document we've put together. Um, I mean, initially we were saying, you know, isolate them, you know, lock them away. <laughs> that's fine for a week or two and then and then what um so we kind of sort of thought well especially yeah i mean the, the jury is still out on the dementia issue we're sort of we've got guys researching that and trying to figure out well, what what's the best advice for that but certainly on the isolation issue we thought well maybe we should say well if there's been no positive uh, case in a in a care home um as, as soon as there's a positive case, basically people go back to their rooms and you have two weeks like that. And as soon as the last two weeks since the last possible uh, positive case, then people can come out of hibernation and have communal activities. Um, but of course, with the same infection control procedures in place as far as we can. Um, so it's a pragmatic way forward, um, which, which you have to just admit there are risks with it, you know. But as far as you can... Um, which is very hard when you've got, you know, um, uh, uh, people in the same communal areas, try to keep them apart if they don't understand about that. So that's with, with yeah, with um, people with dementia, maybe it's a bit of an issue. But um, yeah, so if you could look at ch chapter seven um, in that and let, let us know what you think, that would be good. Um, but I agree, we need a pra pragmatic way forward because this virus is not going to go anywhere soon, you know. Um, Thank you very much. On the 8th of June, we're going to have a session on dementia. The presentations will be on different aspects of in which uh, COVID have affected people with dementia. So anybody, uh, we still have a bit of space for additional speakers. So we'll be very happy to hear from people who'd like to contribute. Uh, we had a comment from uh, Anne Hendry, if you'd like to come in. I was a bit earlier on, so I don't know if you're still here. <laughs> Hi. Oh yes, hi. Yes. Hi there and thank you so much Adelina for your leadership of this series of fantastic webinars and all the work behind the scenes of the team. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about particularly the excess deaths, the deaths that can't be explained by being COVID positive and I just wonder if anybody has yet looked at perhaps the relative absence or reduction in transitional care or intermediate care support for new entrants to long-term care in the community, from community, or indeed um, readmissions to the care home from hospital. Because we do know that transitional, that, that four to six, six weeks transition period is a very fragile, vulnerable period. And, and perception is that that transitional care has been relatively scaled back. I know that there's some fantastic examples around the country and all internationally of really good um, PPE enabled or video enabled transitional care. But I'm just curious if anybody has looked at the data. I'm not aware of any specific data linking these specifically to, to outcomes at this stage. But what we have seen looking at the different measures different countries have taken is that in particular Austria and Germany still have kept a lot of their rehabilitation hospitals and they've been able to use them as step down facilities when people were discharged for, from hospital and before going particularly into care homes. And uh, they uh, in Spain also there's been quite a lot of hotels converted into step-down facilities that were being run by the hospital and hospital staff. And they provided a bit of a mixture of 
immediate rehabilitation after the COVID infection, because quite often people will still be left mm. quite unwell. Yeah. Um, and and then these people were then, uh, but I, I haven't got any data to say that, but we do know that Germany and Austria have had relatively low shares of deaths in care homes. So, mm -hmm. but you know, from that to saying, this is what works is quite a step. Uh, I think Rafael, uh, you had a comment as well, Rafael, is that, yeah? <laughs> Yes, I'd heard that, that it was believed that one of the ways in which the virus has come into uh, care homes, maybe staff within a chain working across care homes within a chain, and that it might be valuable if that could stop. What I'm wondering though is whether the sort of arrangements within some of these care home chains actually enables them to do that, or they just end up even more short staffed. Just interested to know from the <laughs> care home managers taking part whether whether they have made changes or whether it's possible for care homes to make such changes at relatively short notice we, we've seen a few countries banning that completely uh, and what, uh, what and also um sort of deploying search capacity stuff i don't know how well that's worked in practice so one thing is what you read in paper and the other how it actually works in the run i don't know if anybody here who's uh, based or experienced with care homes and whether they have any experience of this, of trying to reduce care staff working across care homes? Anybody like to comment? Um, hi, it's Jane. Uh, uh, hi, Jane. Yes, hi, we have two care homes on the same site um, and quite early on we stopped um, our sort of catering staff and laundry staff coming into each care home. So we try to just cut down the footfall as much as we could. We do try to discourage staff working in different areas, but on occasion we do need them to, to go to the other care home if they're short because it's that risk of safety. Um, and um, But we, we have been quite strict and asked our staff not to, to work. Some staff will work shifts in other care homes. We ask, have asked them earlier on not to do this and, and most of them was obliged by that. Um, we had one case with one member of staff who was working in a community setting out with the care home and the person was suspected COVID positive and we asked her not to come to work. And she did agree with this, but when she spoke to our infection control colleagues in our health service, they had said, no, it was fine for her to come into the care home. But obviously as the manager, I said, well, no, actually it's not. But, but I do think, yeah, that is a high risk um, for other care homes where you've got transient staff or agency workers, definitely. And Damien Fernies, would you like to come in as well? Hi, sure. Uh, um, just um, commenting that the uh, guidance around the new care home infection control fund in the UK majors on that very point. So um, trying to limit care home staff working across multiple settings, agency staff, peripatetic agency staff working across multiple settings. And so the funding's worth approaching £1,000 sterling per, per care home bed. It's allocated on a per bed basis. Um, I think the challenge will be the staffing capacity in in the area to uh, facilitate that because having money is one thing being able to recruit and deploy staff is another thing um, and I think that um, uh, there's also no assurance mechanism built into the um, into the guidance and so money will go uh, I'll go to care homes there'll be some data collection which is a sort of binary data collection are you doing this are you doing that are you doing the other um, but assurance will be limited and sort of levers of control will be limited but at least the new guidance recognizes asymptomatic transmission and the key risks and is starting to try and encourage care homes and uh, local authority commissioners and NHS commissioners in um, uh, promoting the um, infection prevention and control measures that the, the uh, research, including Eric's research, is promoting. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had another uh, comment from David Henderson. If you like to come in on excess deaths. Hi there, yes. Hi. Uh, th thanks very much and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to all the speakers today. It's been a really interesting uh, seminar. I just wanted to 
flag up the, the, the terminology around XSS is very, very difficult to, to accurately define. And sometimes not even using an, an average of the last sort of five years is, is even that is a, is a good measure or a good baseline. It's what I've been using myself. I totally understand that's, you know, we're doing what we can at the moment. But also I think it's to take into context that all deaths, um, we've been able to do some splits between um, whether deaths are in hospital, in the care home, at home or in other institutions. And we're noticing that non-COVID deaths are drastically down in hospital. So um, a lot of deaths that would normally have occurred in the hospital are now getting pushed out into care homes and into the community. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not excess deaths. They are, you know, and there's an awful lot more work there for care homes to take, a, take into consideration, not just the, COVID, the impact of COVID, but all the, the non-hospital deaths that may have occurred elsewhere. So it's an increased burden for those working in care homes. I think it's very difficult to, for us to think about, whilst there obviously will be a, an excess due to COVID, if we just concentrate on looking at care homes on their own, we might miss the wider picture of, we might count deaths as being excess, um, that, that in the grand scheme of things might have been normal. It's very yeah. difficult, it's hard to tease everything out, but I think it's, it's trying to get a big round picture, and I know that's quite yeah. difficult to do internationally as well, depending on yeah. And I think also that different measures tell us different things. So you were saying, if you know there have been more deaths in care homes, you know that care homes have had to deal with more deaths. So the need for palliative care in care homes will be different than, you, than normal. So that would be the, the main message probably. Whereas if you, yeah. But, and we need to take each metric and each measure uh, for what it actually tells us in terms of what, what that means in terms of action. But that's a very... Good point, well made, thank you very much. Are there any more comments from anybody? I, I, I mean, I hope all of, um, I don't know if I mentioned that at the beginning, but this is going to be, so this is being recorded and we normally share the videos. If any of you would rather not have your comment included, please let me know. And, and uh, so uh, I can also, I'm going to share my email as well, so you can all see it. And then we'll make sure that if you didn't want to be in the video, we can remove your comment just in case. So my comment, my email is on the chat box, just so you know. Um, but uh, these have been fantastic contributions. I don't know if anybody got about two minutes for another quick comment. Uh, offers to speak are welcome. Uh, we are going to try to have more admin today in the end in the comments, for example, because. Your paper was first, Clara, we haven't discussed as much about unpaid care, but we think that there's enough going there that we will have a dedication section, uh, webinar se um, session to uh, unpaid care at some point as well. We're very keen to hear about themes. As I said, next week we'll be mostly hearing about the experience of countries in Asia. We'll be hearing um, the week after about dementia. The week after will again be about care homes, but more international experiences, including from South Africa. We haven't yet got a topic for the one after, so feel free to claim it and suggest, and we'll be very happy to listen. Um, thanks again to everybody for your presentations and your comments and, and your encouragement as well you know, through the chat box, which is very much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks.